Right, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third in our series of webinars to celebrate the centenary of the Isle of Wight Natural History and Archaeological Society, which uh, was formed just over 100 years ago. Uh, my name is Matthew Chatfield. I'm the president of the society, and I'll be chairing this evening's session. Um, so uh, we would have had a real live conference uh, last year, but unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, we didn't. So we're now delighted to present the series of webinars. So our first speaker this evening is uh, Professor Juliet Brody, and Juliet is a research leader in phycology at uh, London's Natural History Museum and uh, National Authority on Seaweeds. So you may be familiar with her project, The Big Seaweed Search, which is online. And so if, uh, if you're not, then you should go and look at it. Um, Julia is going to be talking about how environmental change is associated with non-native seaweeds. So Julia, please take it away. So uh, hopefully you can all see the full screen now. And um, I should say too, uh, a big thank you to Roger Herbert for inviting me to speak. And it's very nice to see so many people joining. And I'm just sorry that we can't all be in the Isle of Wight in person. But I just thought to start with, before I begin the talk, talk proper, I've put in a, a quiz and I'm kind of hoping that you might all get going in the chat. But I've got some pictures here of shores and they're all around the world and none of them on the Isle of Wight. And I'd like you to have a go at guessing where you think they are. And I'll just leave that for, for a moment, but um, see if you can have a go at recognizing where you think any of those shores might be. And then at the end, I'll show you where they are and I'll tell you why I showed them as well. So, um, um, so whilst you're looking at that, I'm just going to um, introduce really what I'm going to talk about this evening. So I am going to talk about marine algal invasions and are all aliens equal? And I hope that during the course of this talk, I'll answer that question or at least give you a flavor of the nature of the subject. And one thing I would say is, it's a huge topic. And, you know, I could sort of spend probably the whole talk on one species alone. So I'm going to give you really an overview and I'm going to try and give you a sort of global view. And I'm going to try and put the Isle of Wight and Britain into that context. So, um, so you know, it'll be a sort of taste and it'll be very much my, my sort of take on it. So, so let's, let's start. I hope you've all got the answers now. And so marine algal invasions, are all aliens equal? And one of the things about aliens is that, that over a period of time, they've, they've had a very, um, if you like, they, they've had a very sensational press. And some of you may have seen in the news over the years, things like the killer algae or killer algae on the loose or attack of the killer algae. And I don't know if any of you remember back, um, I'd say one or two of you at this, this evening might to these posters wanted. And so, you know, the, the press has really sensationalized this. And in, in some areas, they, they are right to do so. But in others, for example, here in Britain, I think my, my sort of take home message at the beginning is that we're gonna have to learn to love our aliens. So I will come back to this, but just to start with, I want to tell you a bit about what seaweeds are. For any of you that are really unsure about what I'm talking about, I know you're surrounded by the sea on the Isle of Wight, so you'll be familiar with the shores. But just to try to give that, give that a context. So, so we have the red algae, the green algae, and the brown algae. And the red algae originated over 1.6 billion years ago. They are some of the oldest eukaryotes on the planet. The same with the green algae, 1.6 billion years ago. And they, they belong in this group called the Archaeoplastida, which is where we have the green photosynthetic plants and then, and then our, and our algae. So they're very much um, in that same group with the land plants. But then you have a completely different group, which is the brown algae, and they are much younger. They're only 200 million years ago. 
And again, an extremely interesting group, but, but quite different to, to these two. The other thing about the seaweeds is that they're habitat forming. And you know, you'll all be familiar with kelp forests. And I just want you, you to take note too, this is, this is the main kelp that we have around Britain, which is Laminaria hyperborea. This is our, our main kelp. And you'll see that it's very, very rich in terms of diversity living on it, living amongst it. It's making this wonderful architecture. And I, I will mention that later on. So just hold that thought. And then again, you'll be very familiar with the, the racks and the fucoids that form these intertidal habitats. We also have habitat formers with the, these calcified seaweeds. These are our coralline algae, like these crusts, which you'll see particularly at low tide. And if anybody has, is a diver, you'll know in the subtitle. And then around parts of Britain, we have mole beds. And these are, are mobile calcified seaweeds, and they support a huge diversity of species. So the seaweeds, they've had a long time to develop many traits to evolve. And that will be also part and parcel of some of those that are invasive. So um, just to give you some background information here, a definition of what we mean by um, an introduced or invasive species. So it's, the, you'll find lots of different definitions on this, but I'm just using it as a species of red, green, or brown macroalgae that is introduced beyond its native range through human activities and has become successfully established in a new location. So it can be from anywhere in the world. And in fact, if you look at where species are, they're all around the globe, these invasive species. And at the last count or so, there were well over 280 species. And seaweeds in the marine environment are some, some, of, the, you know, some of the bigger groups of organisms. What about the impact? Well, again, this is a huge topic, but they can be negative or they can have an impact on the native species. And the other thing is that, at least in initially, the local herbivores tend to prefer indigenous food to introduce seaweeds. And how did these aliens get there? Well, there are many means of vectors. And some of these are much more important than others, but sometimes we don't know the mechanism that might, might eventually be found out. Some of them are aquarium introductions, perhaps when people have emptied aquaria into the sea. Some are through aquaculture, and this is an in, a really increasing problem. You know, there's a huge demand for aquaculture around the world. You know, I work on this big global seaweed project, and we have people out in Malaysia and the Philippines and in um, Tanzania, and they are losing about 15% of their um, production through invasive pests and diseases. And a lot of species have been moved around the world in this way, and they've brought in various um, diseases or various haplotypes. And it's a bit like the salmon, they get out into the wild and they, they um, hybridize with the native stock as well. Very, very big problem. Shellfish park farming is another, and I've got a picture here of an oyster, and I'll go back to shells a little bit later on. Ballast propagules, um, hull, hull fouling species on the bottom of boats, fishing gear, research. You know, researchers can take them on their wellingtons and things like that. Um, and then we have this, these Lesepsian uh, migrants, which come in via the Suez Canal. So they're back to the 19th century, which is very topical at the moment. And you might come across these terms like escape, hitchhikers, stowaways. And just to go back to the killer algae, here is the killer alga, which is Colapa taxifolia. And this is really a huge problem in the, in the Mediterranean. It was introduced through the aquarium in um, Monaco, it's thought to be emptied, and it has spread dramatically through the Mediterranean. And, you, and one of the seas where you do get real problems with introductions, where they become highly invasive is in the Mediterranean. It's much less of a problem here in Britain, and I'll go back to that. But you can see here also that it has 
these rhizoidal bases, it can spread very rapidly and, and it really gets into the seagrass beds and it tends to sort of affect the, the red seaweeds as well. A big problem. We have this species here. With, now this is a, a Lesespian species here. This is Codium parvulum. This is in Haifa in Israel. And co coincidentally, the author's name is Israel. And you can see here that they get these massive um, blooms of it on the beach, very, very unsightly, very unpleasant. And then you get things like hull fouling organisms. And you can see here um, the boats in marinas and, and the sorts of species, particularly things like Andaria that I'll go back to, that's Wakami, on, on the hulls of boats. So those are just some examples. Now I mentioned shells and you know, if you, if you, you know, buy a mussel or if you buy oysters and things, they often you can see they've perhaps got red patches or they've got uh, species living on them. They've got these little polychaete worm shells living on them. And this is really, you know, oysters are moved around a lot around the world. So they might come in from the Pacific, they might come into the Tau Lagoon in France and then they're shipped up to the North to be grown on, and then they might be sent over elsewhere. There's a, there's a huge movement of these shells. And I want to give you an example here of porphyra. Um, uh, we've actually changed a lot of the names, but I'll, I'll just call it that for the moment. But you're probably familiar with this perhaps from lava bread or nori. So the wrapping is made out of a species like this. And it's a really interesting species because, again, it has a fossil record dating back to 1.2 billion years old. But it has this very interesting life history where part of the life history is this conchocelis phase and part of it is this blade phase. And this, um, this was described, conchocelis rosea, as a separate species originally. And it was this lady here, Kathleen Drew, very famous lady in phycology, who put together the life history. And she wrote a little paper to nature, a hundred lines that changed the world. And she made the link between the conchocelis and the porphyra. And that's really the basis of the modern nori industry. And you can see here that what we did, we took, we took plants like this, we let them release their spores. We put oyster, these Pacific oyster shells in our culture dishes, and we just let them grow. And you get this pink on the shells. So you can imagine that if you're moving your oysters around, you're taking these organisms with you. And in fact, this is exactly how they, the modern nori industry works. This is in Japan and you can see all the shells here. These are all seeded with the conchocelis and then they're taken out offshore to, to grow the, the, the nori. Um, and I think it's always good to get a mammal in a talk. So we have a whale here and Another vector, and, and you know, I really, really would love to do this experiment, is these large mammals. So you can see that they have these barnacles on their tails, and sometimes on their heads, on their noses, and barnacles are shells. And I know from my work that you can isolate lots of different algae from barnacles. And it could well be that you're taking things like the conchocelis I mentioned, and you know, we have some really interesting um, bipolar species. So you have species in the north and you get something very similar in the south. And I've often wondered, how can that be? And then I thought, well, maybe these whales are just taking these species around the world. You know, and this is kind of like a, a, a sort of natural method. I, and I would love to be able to get some of these barnacles and I'd like to be able to use some of these modern techniques where we can put them through what we call a next generation sequencer. And that will give us a whole lot of DNA. And then we can see what's inside those barnacles. And that would be a great project. I just need to catch a whale. So, you know, that's my first task. So let's move on to Britain. And I mean, I mean, if I was there with you, I would ask you a question at this point, and I would ask you how many species of seaweed you reckon there are in the world. Well, you can put it in the chat if you want, but I will tell you, and it's about 12,000 species have been identified, but we think there's probably maybe double that. But what I've got here is I've got the um, very latest data on all of this. 
So just by chance, a few weeks ago, I was doing a red list assessment with a couple of my colleagues. And, and if you're not familiar with red list, you've probably heard of red list species. So this is an international method of assessing the threat that species are under. And um, so in order to do that, you have to have a very good species list. And so what I did in 2016 was published a checklist and you can see that we've got 644 species then. And then in 2021, we had 650 species. Now, a little bit about this is taxonomy. It's all those sorts of things. So, so it varies a bit as to um, the numbers, but it is a slight increase. You can see the distribution of reds, greens and browns. So they're, they're uh, sort of double the number of reds, which is typical in, in the temperate zones. As you go further north, you tend to get a few more browns. And then here I've got the non-natives and you can see again, the reds tend to dominate. And you can see there's actually been an increase in the, in the non-natives over the last five years. And the percentage of that, it was 5% in 2016 and it's now about 6%. So this is something that we're seeing is um, that the number of species of invasive species are increasing around the world. And I probably should say at this point too, that the red data list uh, results, the assessments are really startling. They're really shocking. And 50% of the British seaweeds are threatened or near threatened. It's about 25% threatened or and 25% near threatened. Threatened will be things like endangered or vulnerable or, um, or, or you know, one of those categories. And that to me is a really shocking finding. Um, now, I don't think it, it's not necessarily to do with the invasives, but things are changing very rapidly. And I think that's another point that, that needs to be taken home from this talk. So here's the list of non-native species. And you can see, I mean, you, you don't need to really sort of read this, but you can sort of see the sorts of things. And I've got some pictures here and I'm going to show you some more. But again, you can see this very large, lots of reds. Some of them we've just found really, really recently. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about those as we go along. And um, Col some you might be very familiar with. You might see these washed up on the beach. So, so there's oyster thief, Colcomenia, and it's called that because these can get very, very big and they can settle on the oysters and they can actually lift them up like a sort of balloon, like you might try and get a wreck off the bottom of the sea with, with, balloon, with balloons. Here we've got Gratilupia turuturu, which is a very common alien, the devil's tongue, particularly along the south coast. Again, you'll be familiar with that in the Isle of Wight. We have this little one here, which came in in about 2000, I'm guessing about 2005, 10, 6, that sort of time. This is a species from the Pacific called Acanthus okamuri, and we called this Okamura's pom-pom weed. It's like little pom-poms or little pin cushions. Just some examples. Now, the other thing to notice that some of these aliens have been around for a long, long time, um, and we don't think anything, we wouldn't know they were aliens, except that, that we've learned that, and I'll show you how we know some of that. We know that they've been here because we have them in the herbaria, in different parts of the world, so in the Natural History Museum. We have these records, and these are incredibly useful, so we're able to actually go back and to see what has been collected when. And so if we have a look here, here's the oyster thief again, the Colpomenia. This, these specimens, 1907. So it's been around for well over hundred years. This one, this is, this is one of these porphyras. It's actually now called Neopiropia. That's what we taxonomists do. We like to keep ourselves in work by splitting things up, but you didn't worry about that. But this has been reported in 1883. And Codium fragile, this specimen is from the 1960s, but I suspect it's been around for longer than that. This is a very interesting one, and I'll talk a little bit about that one, talk about some of these. And then this last one, you can't see it very well, it's just tiny, but I've left the label there. That was 1890, and this is another interesting one too. So they've been around a long time, and a lot of how we view them is in our heads, it's our perception. They're not really any bother. 
So how do we know these are some of these aliens? Well, this is where it gets quite technical, but this is a phylogenetic tree. So this is, these are all the molecular data. And we, basically what happens is species group into what we call clades. And these clades are more closely related than those clades. And here is a clade where you can see there are some from China. It's, it's largely a Pacific clade. And here's, here's Porphyra leucosticta. Here it is. You can see it's got these little white patches. And if you can just see, I don't know how well you can see this, but just here in the tree, there's Piropia fucicola and next to Porphyra leucosticta. So leucosticta we have in Britain. Fucicola is from the Pacific. And that's the clue that this is almost certainly a Pacific alien, but we've had it here for so long and it's no bother. It just is really a nice species. And in fact, in the Isle of Wight, you've got another species very like it that, that doesn't yet have a name, but uh, you know, so it's not really any problem at all. But that's how we know, that's how we are learning, how we know what these are. I mentioned this species Codium. Now, it's, this is an interesting one because in Britain, it's, it's really quite common and you can see it orig its origin is here where this star, can you see the star, the green star? And um, you've got its sort of native range in this area. And this is where it has spread to. So it's global and it's actually down in the Falklands here as well. We found this a couple of years ago when we did a big survey down there. But it's not really a problem too much in Britain, but you go to Canada and it's really a huge problem. And one of the reasons for this, and it's again, a bit like uh, in the Mediterranean, things like that, it seems to be something to do with the diversity. Now, Mediterranean's diverse, so that doesn't really work in the enclosed basin. But here in Britain, we have a very diverse flora, seaweed flora, much less so in Canada. And therefore, is there something to do with the sort of niches occupied or where these species can grow that makes them much worse in some parts of the world than the others? And that goes back to my question of, are all aliens equal? It depends very much on where they are in the world. But you can see here, and I've put, put a nice specimen in for you for the Isle of Wight, beautiful material in the Outer Hebrides. And here they are in the Falkland Islands. And we have very nice molecular data for all of these, which shows that they are that, spe that species and that subspecies. We have this other interesting um, example. I've mentioned these different life history stages. So we've got this one here, Asparagopsis armata. See, it's got these little hooks, which is a trait which enables it to hook onto things. So you can imagine that sort of coming around the world, sort of thing you probably get on a wetsuit, you know, and you could take your wetsuit off to somewhere else. And these things are quite hardy. They are, they'll survive in some form or other. And that also has a different life history here, this little fuzzy fork and burgia phase. And it's interesting because they have different distributions and they were just discovered at different times. And again, it's sort of making all these links between things. And you can see that this species of Sparagopsis was first detected in Galway in 1939. And there's the sporophyte phase. And that's a picture from Nico and when hence it says no, that doesn't mean no, it's his initials. Um, and here you've got Traliella, which is the little fuzzy phase of Bonimasonia. And these tend to be much more widespread than the, this phase. You can see the little hooks here on the Bonamisonia. And again, you could imagine that hooking onto things and, and traveling, you know, like a hitchhiker. And you can see that that was first, the Traliella phase, this phase was first detected on the Isle of Wight in 1890. And then the Gametangel phase later. So you can see, you know, they've been here a long time. And I'm interested to know, are they spreading as temp climate change? you know, is influencing things. So we're getting closer to home and you'll recognize this, I'm sure. This is the Isle of Wight, this is Denbridge. And, um, and I'm sure as you all know that the Isle of Wight is special where it lies in the Solent. It's very, very um, distinctive in terms of its oceanography, its, its geology and it's um and it's biogeography as well and and you know it's this sort of hub if you like and i and of course it's a big shipping area which is one of the reasons why you might anticipate aliens coming in it's got these double tides you've got these incredibly rich shores 
And you've also got what we call this Lusitanian flora, which are these warm water species, which can live there um, from the Western Channel. And you've got the cold water species as well, living there, species on the edge of their range. So you get this sort of mix, if you like, of warm and cold water species. And the other interesting thing is that, um, as far as I know, that the Isle of Wight, it's a bit of a barrier to species moving east as well, to seaweeds moving east. So it's a very, very interesting area. The only disadvantage of it is I've found working there is that the really good tides tend to be at five in the morning or sort of five or six at night. So if you go in the sort of autumn or winter, you might just sort of wandering around in the dark or semi-dark to do your shore work, but you kind of get used to that. Um, and so here we are now, and this is one of the sort of famous um, invasives. So this is an example of an invasive that, uh, um, really hit the headlines. And I think, I don't know, I think Bill Farnham may be in the audience. So this was Farnham and um, Bob Fletcher, who some of you may know from Hailing Island, and also Linda Irvin, who, who sadly died last year, about a year ago. She was in her 90s. So they published another little paper to Nature. You can see here, just very tiny. And, you know, as a scientist, it's always your ambition to get a paper in nature, it's very difficult to do um, these days. And so Sargassum muticum, the wireweed, was really, really the classic invasive that, that people got to know about. And they tried to eradicate it, but they couldn't. And you can see here, it's, it's global distribution, it's really a Pacific species and it is spread. It's actually spread further than you can see here. Now it's up in the Alt Hebrides, it's, it's further around. I think it's up in Norway. And is it a problem? It, it's thought to be a nuisance. It, it can smother seagrass beds. There's no long-term data, and that's something to bear in mind that that's really an issue that we have is the lack of long-term data with this. So we don't really know whether it's having a huge impact, but it seems like some of the herbivores are getting used to it. After about 40 years or more, they're beginning to sort of eat it more, I think. I like it, it's nice. I say, learn to love your aliens. Probably the worst alien we have in Britain, as far as we can tell, um, and we've worked with Helen Roy on this, who I think spoke the other day, is Undaria. This is Wakami. It's a thug. It's a bit of a thug. You can see it here. And here, here you can see the boats and underwater, the, the, the Wakami growing on the hulls of the, the boats in the marinas. And you have it in the Isle of Wight and it's spreading and it's now on the shore, you go to somewhere like Pool Harbor, it's, it's very common there in the shallow water. And that's, that's probably one of our most worrying aliens in Britain, I would say. But again, you can eat it and it's, it's supposed to be very good for you. So, you know, again, maybe we just have to learn to love it and learn to use it. But as I mentioned, things are changing and they're changing rapidly. And it, you can see here are the biogeographic zones, and um, so all around Britain, we have these different, different zones, biogeographically um, distinct. And this was a piece of work that I did with my colleagues, with Chris Yesen and, and some others. And what we did was we looked at 40 years of data and basically where you see this red, um, some of these large brown species are really moving north. They're really disappearing from the south. And there's been an overall temperature change of about two degrees in the last 40 years. And, and some of the changes have been much more rapid in the last 20 years as well. Things are, are getting warmer, Thing, things are changing, seaweed distributions are changing. And that this brings me on to your remember Laminaria hyperborea at the beginning with all the very rich stipes. Well, here's Laminaria ochraluca, and that was first recorded in 1948, the south coast here. The most northern record that we knew was in Lundy until very recently. It's on the Isle of Wight. And that's its eastern limit as far as we know at the moment. We pre predicted it in our paper with Chris Yesen. We predicted it in Ireland and that was published in 2019. It was found in 2018. We said it would spread. We think the Bristol Channel may be stopping it spreading. And you can see that it has a stipe that's pretty much bare of um, epiphytes and therefore and, and it seems to be moving into where Laminaria hyperborea is disappearing in the southwest. 
We have this other little species, Flabelia, which is a possible relic or a possible introduction. This is the one we don't know. Again, it's in the Isle of Wight and it's just been discovered fairly recently. It's a very common in, it's sort of circum globally one. It's very common in the Mediterranean and it's just been found in a few places subtidally. Um, this doesn't seem to be any problem at all. It's just a very nice find to have, maybe just another range expansion. The Isle of Wight is a great place if you want to find aliens. So when I was down there um, a, a few years ago, I found this species here, which is a, another Mediterranean species, first record of that, which is Gastrocolonium clavatum. You might just be able to make it out here. So it's not very easy to pick out, but these are wonderful habitats to go alien hunting down at Bembridge if you want to go. And it's a really easy shore to work to. It's, it's a wonderful shore. You can see the sargassum, but we're kind of used to that. I'm looking for new things, you know, sort of like, you know, treasure hunt. And then we've got the one at the bottom here. And this is a really interesting one because I, I don't know what this is. It might be a hypnia. Nobody knows what it is. And we haven't been able to get DNA out of it. And I'd love it if people saw it again. I'd really like to know what it is. And I'm just coming towards the end of the talk now. And I think I've shown you some very um, different examples of things. And also that things are changing all the time and that new species are coming in. But we are in such a good position here in Britain. And the reason for that is that we have a checklist. And, you know, we've had a checklist in Britain since the, for about 50 years or more now. And um, again, we published this one in 2016. And um, that's been really useful for the red list. And you can see all the things it enables us to do. We can record, we can map distributions. We've done the atlas. We can make seaweed floras and guides. And we've just published a new um, updated version of this book, 2020. We can monitor the impact of environmental change. We can look for those non-natives. We know what's native and we know what's here and we know what's not here. So we can recognize things. We can do the red list assessments, as I've mentioned, and that, that is shocking. We've managed to get more species onto some of the conservation lists than we had in the past as well. And we can do some citizen science. And if you feel like you want to join in, and, and Matthew's mentioned this, we have the big seaweed search. And so this is an opportunity for anyone to go out and look for these aliens and look for some of these other species like the calcified species that might be being affected by ocean acidification. Look for these large browns that we know are changing. And we've done this now for a number of years and I'm just about to publish our first paper on this to have a look at the data. And it's very, very interesting what we're finding. And we are able to actually look at every piece of data. And because we have grid references and we have photos, we know that those data can be used in research. And if, if you want to have a look, there's the website. So, and I just want to say a huge thank you to, um, again, to being invited and to all the people that have, um, I haven't put up acknowledgements, but many, many people and some funding agencies have helped with this research and the Natural History Museum. And thanks to Roger for coming out with us in the field. And when we were down there, which was great, and it just really leaves me to say, um, yeah, learn to love your aliens. They're around, they're not gonna go away. Keep looking for them. And now for the big reveal of the quiz. So there you are. So A, and actually I haven't actually put the letters in the box, so I'm gonna have to tell you this. So the Caspian is actually uh, this one up here. I can't actually, I've got a thing in front of this. So it's this one here, the top, middle, Chile is D, England is A, that's Sidmouth, Iceland is B, uh, F is Peru, and Scotland is this one up here. And the reason I put that in is to show you, you can go all the way around the world and you can find shores. And I, I wonder how many of you managed to get some of those right or are really surprised at the answer. But this is the thing about seaweeds, they're global. We're losing them, we're losing 30% of our kelp forests around the world. We're seeing this movement around the world. But everywhere you go, where there are these shores, you're going to find seaweeds. And uh, they really are a most amazing group of organisms. Thank you very much. That's me. Many thanks indeed, Juliet. That was, uh, that was really quite good. I'll, I will admit that I was thinking that one of those was Scotland, and I should have said, but 
there we go it's easy in retrospect isn't it so thanks for being so interactive our next speaker and uh, this is someone who uh, will be familiar to very many of us uh, Ian Boyd's one of the Ireland's best known environmental polymaths founder of art consulting and an expert and visionary inventor who's been working on the interaction between people and the natural environment on the island and beyond for a long time Ian is going to be talking about greening urban infrastructure. So, Ian, please carry on. OK, I hope that's OK and visible. So <clears throat> I'm just going to quickly uh, set the scene about urban infrastructures and then really concentrate on, on coastal infrastructure as a sort of special case study that the island is amazingly advanced in and has the capacity to really lead the world, which is very exciting. Um, so... Um, Urban environments, urban coastal environments are everywhere, following on from the, from Juliet's talk. It is a global phenomenon. But here on the Isle of Wight, we have the, 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 the uniquely British phenomenon of seaside resort towns, constrained not only by their own history, so not quite knowing where to go next, like Sandown, where I, where I am, where I'm talking from now, but also by the level of designation in the case of the Isle of Wight and the New Forest. So the Isle of Wight's only about 10% urban, New Forest about 8% urban not really going to change very much just because of the degree of um, conservation designation and protection in policy and law that exists. So that's very reassuring and it's a good thing. But how to manage those little pockets of urban coast are, uh, is extremely important. Um, but we also in the Solent region have um, coastal cities. So we have Portsmouth and we have Southampton, 80-85% urban. And of course this really is an expanding global phenomenon. Um, so even though the pace of global <clears throat> population increase is rapidly slowing, will we make it to 10 billion? Um, urbanization is increasing as people move to the coast. So urban cities and the urban infrastructure of coastal areas continues to accelerate. And therefore, it's a really important issue to try and understand and to intervene in. And the solar, it's an amazing place to be able to do that. And the Isle of Wight can contribute very much to that discussion. But just a couple of things about infrastructures and about the urban rural battlefield um, and it's a shame in some ways that it's become so polarized so there is perhaps a tendency to venerate and sometimes even deify um, rural green space and it's not always warranted so quite in some cases it's a it's a massively simplified um, ecosystem with the wildlife pushed to the edges it's a monoculture high inputs all the things we know about not always but it is sometimes so it isn't necessarily the case that rural green space is just full of wildlife it isn't the sole repository of wildlife it really really isn't and it would be really good to be thinking a bit more creatively and imaginatively and positively about urban ecosystems because they can be absolutely spectacular and fascinating this is a really interesting little diagram from Portsmouth University but urban ecosystems really only uh, relatively poorly understood still they're novel ecosystems all of the things that Juliet talked about here about loving natives about the possibilities of novel ecosystems about constructed ecosystems are alive and well in the urban environment and it's a great place to explore some of these ideas urban environments have massive complexity this incredible network of small little patchworks um, of uh, private space of public space of commercial space all overlapping that's lake that's just up the road as well so that's really super hyper local but that's amazing that's got an urban triple si right in the middle of it all of those little gardens the school playing field the cemetery they're all communicating mobile species moving between them doing their best to find a home in there but also urban spaces have elevation terrestrial urban spaces have tremendous elevation we're building entirely new geology with every development that happens, often thoughtlessly and appallingly badly, making terrible places for people and not thinking about wildlife at all, but we are building them. And <clears throat> there are things we can do about that later. We should be doing them in advance, but we can retrofit solutions as well. So the idea of space, of 3D, of creating these, these structures that have the potential to support wildlife, and of course, uh, is where people live. So the encounter between people and wildlife is alive in a way, in, in immediate in a way, in urban places that it isn't in other places. So in marine, uh, urban marine areas, uh, it's all about hard edges, really. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, the, uh, the defense of the coast, urban infrastructure, sea walls, ports, marinas, and so on, all involve hard edges about drawing a line between uh, the coastal environment and its terrestrial hinterland. And it has all sorts of problems associated with it and some opportunities. But of course, also, it introduces novel structures into the coastal environment that are completely unique. I mean, I suppose this is as close as we get to our mangrove forest is Ride Pier. It's an amazing permanent structure that is alive 
alive at low tide and alive at high tide. So we can build, this was accidental, but we've learned so much about the what it delivers for uh, coastal ecology by going down there and having a prod about and seeing what's under there. We can build things that positively interact with the natural world. We can contribute. It is not hopeless. And the amazing stuff that we see around ripe here is a great example. So urban environments also are extremely dynamic, adaptive, and therefore evolutionary domains. So this constant, persistent, adaptive pressure for organisms to find the best they can to optimize their own existence in urban environments is an amazingly creative and dynamic place. We kind of think of urban wildlife as just being a bit scabby and awful. Somehow it's just clinging on, but actually uh, they're really healthy, robust versions are out in the rural wilderness. So it's just, just not the case. It's a different kind of fitness. Uh, resource provision is different. Social groupings are different. Uh, the shape and space of bird territories are different because of the way that urban environments provide the resources in different kind of packaging. So you can get very, very dense concentrations of wildlife in urban environments. That's not to say it is a paradise. It isn't. There are all sorts of threats. There's noise pollution, light pollution. There's pets. There's all sorts of stuff they have to contend with. But nonetheless, it is a living, dynamic environment. And we should be treating it that way. We should be thinking about how we can use it to learn how to create better places for wildlife and for people. But just to concentrate on marine infrastructure, on coastal infrastructure, this is really all about coastal squeeze. Once we defend, once we draw that hard line, there is no longer any gradation in land from that hard point. So the possibility of habitats forming beyond that simply goes away. And as sea level rise impacts on that hard surface, the intertidal zone gets smaller and smaller, and eventually the, the, the tide just goes up and down a wall. So that's a really massive issue. What are we going to do about the diminishing domain of the intertidal? Are there things we can do? And that was a question we asked uh, and came up with a solution. Um, which is the vertipool. It's a retrofit. It is really hanging a rock pool on a seawall, doing it in ones and in groups, and we'll come to that in, in a moment. But the idea of being able to take a rock pool from the foreshore and stick it onto a wall, that's essentially what underpins uh, the work of art ecology and the idea of the vertebral. And there, are, there are now five different models, and there are 500 of these things around the world. Um, it's a simple idea. It's an incredibly simple idea. <clears throat> it's such a simple idea that it's quite impossible to patent and protect, which is something that we've discovered recently. But that's OK. Um, the fact that it's open source is a wonderful thing, and sharing it with the world is, is really incredibly important. Um, but that's all there is to it. It holds water between the tides, and it has a complex design surface that is colonizable in a way that a blank, smooth seawall is less so. It doesn't mean to say there's not stuff living on, on there. There is. Now, these are the heroes behind uh, the idea of the vertipool, and we're extremely grateful for our long-term collaboration with Bournemouth University. Uh, Dr. Alice Hall, uh, Roger Herbert, Dr. Roger Herbert, Jess Bowen there as well. And of course, Nigel George, bottom right, who is has made every one of those 500 vertipals with his team. And really, this wouldn't exist without his particular genius and the crossover between the natural world and artistic sensibility. An incredibly important part of it. So we've learned so much from this team about what you do when you introduce this retrofit solution to the seawall. And what we found is that they work spectacularly well. They increase species richness and species, uh, species abundance, certainly in comparison with the seawall, but they even outcompete natural rock pools. Now, this is not that surprising. We're coming back to the way that we expect species to optimize the, the habitats that they inhabit. But what if we could take an optimal habitat and deliberately design all those features in, in one place at, what time, uh, at one time? And that's kind of what we've done with vertipoles. So they are very large spaces concentrated down into very small spaces. It's a different kind of coastal squeeze. We've folded very large surface areas down into these small pots and, and hung them on the wall. Deeply complex surface texture, the pattern are there that can colonize in all sorts of ways. And then the pool that has ridges and shelves and all sorts of, of customizable features. These are actually in Gibraltar, so we're getting uh, interesting feedback from the Mediterranean too in, in how these are performing. But these work tremendously well, and one of the most fascinating things is the halo effect. So as well as introducing dr quite dramatic ecological uplift in and of themselves, they, they spill out around uh, the area around. So you get this uplift 
they're on the seawall around them. And that's something we're very, very interested in. How can we spread that benefit? So what's the optimal number of vertipoles to give the maximum push out across the seawall? In that way, you can begin to think how you can populate a very large area with a very small number of interventions because the spaces in between become enlivened and enriched as a consequence of this effect. So it's fascinating, and we have a great deal more to learn about this. That's an example. There's some uh, images at the top of vertipoles in different shapes and sizes and different designs. But this is an example of an array, uh, a pattern that we might think of putting out between large and small pools. The interstitial spaces at this point become very important. They are altered uh, as a consequence of these arrays being, being put on the seawall. These become different spaces. They have a different dynamic. The way that water moves across them, the way that air moves across them, humidity in them and around them changes. So all of these things can be concentrated um, in small packages and enable us to go to the next place and do it again. Ecologically meaningful distance, perhaps the dispersal distance of a key organism that we're interested in sustaining in a stressed um, urban coastal environment. So we're learning huge amounts with the collaborations with Bournemouth University. We've also worked a bit with Glasgow University, and this is Dr. Murray MacArthur. Um, this is uh, uh, testing out different tile patterns. There are still 24 of the original 50 left on Shanklin Groin. If you want to go down and have a look, you're very welcome. Um, and again, this was the idea of what textures work for what organisms. This was particularly barnacle colonization. What do they settle on and what do they stick on? And is there an optimal design? Um, and of course, complexity is key, but it is, it's more complicated than that. And we got very, very interested in all of these possibilities, vertipoles, tiles, different kinds of built interventions in the marine environment around the Isle of Wight. Now that's really, really exciting because the Isle of Wight, now two years on, is a world biosphere reserve. It's part of a, a club of 700 other biospheres, UNESCO, United Nations biospheres. So, and that's the size of it. It's absolutely huge. It's the whole of the Solent. It touches three counties. So by concentrating our skills and experience and the partnerships I've talked about here on the Isle of Wight, within the Isle of Wight biosphere, not only can we try and build up the, um, and the Solent as a hub of expertise, but we can talk to other biospheres. We can communicate around the world through the biosphere network, learning from them, trying different deployments and different techniques. It's a very small club of folks working in this built, constructed marine habitat environment, particularly in the intertidal. There's only really four organizations, four companies in the world. So we're really lucky to be in at this early stage. There's so much we can, we can learn. So the biosphere is very important for that. Uh, a key part of this is the idea of design as well. So as I mentioned, Nigel George, who has made every one of these things, is an artist. So can we introduce not only an optimized texture, but an artistically pleasing one? These are public places, these are public realms that we're talking about. Can we actually make them pleasing for people as well as wildlife? We use folded paper techniques, believe it or not. We use origami to create complicated textures that we can mold from. So last few slides. <clears throat> and to move on to some of the other ideas about built ecology in the urban domain. One of the fascinating things is it's not new. We, we're used to bird boxes on buildings. Um, developers hate them still, bat boxes on buildings, but this is 5,000 years old. This is a dovecot from the upper Nile. And we haven't really moved on from the idea. In fact, we've probably gone backwards aesthetically. Um, we make things that are pretty ugly for key target species. This is a swift box here incredibly important. But in terms of constructing habitats in the urban realm, there is so much scope to be architecturally interesting, to be stimulating to people as well as to wildlife. Why not do this? Well, I mean, there's probably quite a few reasons, but it could be done. So we can make spectacle out of urban interventions in a way that is still ecologically functional. It doesn't have to be hidden away. It doesn't have to be anonymous. It can be spectacular. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity. There are other things being built too, bee bricks uh, made by the Green and Blue Company in Cornwall, absolutely wonderful. John Little and his grass roof company, bottom left, making bike shelters with green roofs on, and our own biototems, these drilled timbers on the right. There's a lot of work going on in uh, this arena, this idea of building functional ecological objects in, in urban environments. And everyone can play a part. You can do this. You just need a drill. You don't need any of those things. Just go and drill holes in things. Works amazingly. Everything's over-engineered. If you've got fence posts, just drill some holes in it. Your house won't fall down. It'll be fine. And that's a, so we can play with these ideas 
Um, zero fights are obviously a key part of, of, of green roof ecology. That's a really interesting link with the coastal environment here. Can we start to play around with that and introduce dune floras and vegetated shingle floras in the urban environment quite deliberately um, and authentically? Yes, we absolutely can. Um, we need to stop maintaining um, urban spaces to the detriment of these things happening naturally. You don't need to pay for a green roof. A green roof will happen entirely naturally as long as you can just stop scraping it away. That would be marvellous. So this idea of the tyranny of maintenance in urban spaces is something else that we need to think about. We maintain spaces um, in order to be able to monitor to see if they're okay. So quite often, um, sea walls will be scraped clean of, of cover just to say, yeah, the wall's fine. Well, yes, it, it, it is fine. It's absolutely partly because of the cloaking fauna and flora that was already on there. So can we just leave some of these things alone to do their own thing once we present them with the right kind of places? Last couple. Hope this is OK. Joan, I'm still on time. Um, so... <clears throat> Slightly blurry slide. This is uh, within the uh, within the Thames. So it's in, in the Estuarine, uh, London. Um, we need to start thinking about how urban green spaces connect together. So here is a missed opportunity. We could be talking about interventions in the estuary, verticals, and other things. The green space next to it having a link to that, an ecological connection to that in some way. The green roofs mimicking some of the lost communities as a result of this development and the public parks below communicating with all of that. There's no reason why we can't have amazing green roofs that are shishi and wonderful, and that's great, but also supporting amazing populations, aggregations of solitary bees that are actually then coming down into the public realm because we planted the public parks below with just the right mix of pollen and nectar species. So it becomes a public benefit, becomes a gain for the communities living in these places. Urban ecology is good for people because people are part of urban ecology. We can't cut ourselves out of this. So the techniques we're learning in the marine and coastal environment we need to apply in other ways too. And just the last one, it's all about, also one of the wonderful things about urban ecology is bricolage, it's just found objects, another link with art, another link with the creative industries which is just wonderful. So I just love this, it's, it's shopping trolleys are brilliant because i know they're ugly but they're absolutely amazing at collecting debris if you electrofish that on the isle of wight that'll be full of elvers and bullheads two european priority species global protected species absolutely brilliant but we'll fish it out at some point and then it, it's this determination to tidy is part of the problem so we need to be creative we need to deliberately install things that are that look pleasing to the eye and that have this ecological functionality but we can allow a certain amount of unmaintained slightly chaotic development uh, to take place in urban places and see what happens and it's a fascinating journey so we're learning a lot about how to build habitats for wildlife and the marine uh, um, uh, in marine habitats on the Isle of Wight and there's a, a long way to go but it's a it's a fascinating thing the Isle of Wight is, is is a leader in this and we must continue to do that and so is the Solent. And final slide, just a positive reminder that you and me, we're all part of the biota. We are not a separate thing. And the more that we connect up in this kind of way that we try and bring wildlife into the places where we live and work, the happier we will be and we'll have a better planet for it. So thank you very much. Well, many thanks, Ian. And uh, thanks for the questions coming in on that one. Always, always inspiring to see uh, this uh, wonderful invention from here on the Isle of Wight spreading its way around the world. Uh, really, really good stuff. Um, we're going to move straight on now to our next speaker. Uh, Jim Baldwin is one of the island's most active biological recorders and is our uh, county recorder for dragonflies, damselflies and moths. Um, and uh, Jim is also the island's BTO regional representative. And it's, this is the role he's going to be talk to, talking to us uh, in tonight. And he's going to be talking about blacktail goodwit populations. So please, Jim, take it away. Yes, we're talking tonight about the uh, water bird population trends on the Isle of Wight um, using some of the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology data. Uh, and we're particularly looking at where these have been influenced by climate change. Um, so we're still staying on the water front as we have been with the other talks so far. But what is WEBS? Well, WEBS is the, stands for the Wetland Bird Survey. It's a monitoring scheme for non-breeding water birds, which gives the key data 
to, for conservation for their populations and their wintering habitats. It's a tradition started, the, the Cairns actually started off back in 1947. Um, originally just counting ducks and geese under the National Wildfowl Counts. Uh, but then the, the British Trust for Ornithology came on board in 1969 and came up with the Birds of Estuaries inquiry, which covered waders and gulls and all the other water birds. And these two surveys kept going separately until 1993 when Common Sense put them both together and they were amalgamated into the Wetland Bird Survey. And nowadays we have around 3,000 volunteer counters going out in all weathers, synchronizing these uh, monthly counts to be able to get this key data, which is used by everyone. Um, it's actually, the Wetland Bird Survey itself is a partnership of various organizations, quite a few con conservation organizations like the RSPB, uh, but the actual team is based at BTO headquarters. Well, looking at the climate change, winners and losers, where there's always going to be good and bad with some of these things. But let's face it, if you'd have said 20 to 30 years ago that you were going to be looking at spoonbills in the winter, you wouldn't have realised how much of an effect the, the climate change was going to do to you. But here we are. We are now in a situation where we have around about 75 spoonbills choosing to spend their winter between Pool Harbour and the Western Solent instead of going to Africa. They've taken that migration strategy on board that they're not going to do all the extra travel. The mild winters are keeping them here. The birds are likely to have come from the increased breeding populations in Europe, mainly the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark. Well, in the UK, we're even getting an increasing breeding colony building up in Norfolk. So who's to say one day we won't be having springbills breeding on the Isle of Wight? We've, as we've said, we've now got a regular winter visitor at Newtown. Um, in the last two winters, we've had a cup, up to about 12 springbills being present. And in the Western Yard, we've had four. So uh, this is likely to probably increase as we go along. Another bird that you certainly wouldn't be thinking about in the winter is a sandwich tern. When I was looking, when we were doing uh, our spring migration watches at St Catherine's Point, the sandwich tern was always the first tern that you saw in, in March, April time. And there's always a great joy because it was coming in from Africa because they normally winter off the coast of Ghana. But this last decade, we're now seeing a wintering population of sandwich terns, again between Pool Harbour, spreading out to the east of the Solent, and it's actually in double figures. Can you believe that? Along the northern coastline of the Isle of Wight, they're being recorded in our web scans, <laughs> which never happened before. And it's no great unusual sighting now to actually see up to six sandwich terns in Bembridge Harbour. This, was, this photo was taken in November. And there we have one, two, three, four, five sandwich terns roosting. And in the St. Helens Mill Pond, one sandwich tern busily fishing, just like the summer. It would have been nice to have found out where these birds were actually going though, because that little bird there has actually got a metal ring on its leg. But unfortunately, it was, the photo was about half a mile away and you couldn't get any closer to read the ring. Which brings me to the big question, where are these birds coming from? Are they birds that have stayed back from the south coast population during the summer? Or are they like some other species, like some of the smaller passerines, like the black cap, actually coming from Europe and overwintering here? Clearly there needs to be more study required. And when funds permit, there is talk of a possible colouring project taking place in Pool Harbour. But for every winner, there's always a loser. And the biggest loser on the island at the moment is the knot. Fairly nondescript bird in this winter plumage, looks lovely in this uh, breeding plumage, it's brick red then instead of the gray brown color. Uh, but this little bird, slightly bigger than a dunlin, 
um, was never a great visitor to, to Newtown until the start of the century, this, this current century. And the numbers started to build up until we got to February 2009, and we had over a thousand of them coming, which is great. They, they look really spectacular in their flight. But the recent succession of milder winters in the UK and in mainland Europe as well, has meant these birds now are spending their winter either in the wash or over in the Wadden Sea in the Netherlands. They're choosing to stay either side of that North Sea, just hopping between the North Sea locations, then there's no need for them to travel south to find warmer sites. So they're saving their energy of having to travel further south by staying closer to their breeding sites. The result of that is the Newtown population has crashed by 73% over the last five years, while the medium trend over 10 years is a 50% reduction. Um, although this looks quite dramatic, it's fairly in line with the national trend, excluding the wash, of course. <laughs> the final one's a, a really mixed bag. It's an interesting one because it's quite complex. And this is our friend, the Blacktail Godwit. This is a a medium-sized wader that can live up to 18 years old, doesn't start breeding to us two years old. And there's two actual subspecies seen in the UK. The nominate species is rarely seen on the island because it breeds over in Cambridgeshire and also in Europe. So the actual fly path, when it's going back in the winter to the Mediterranean basin and to Africa, doesn't come over the Isle of Wight. It's only if there's particularly bad weather conditions that can actually blow one off course that we may possibly be able to see one then. They look very similar, only it's bill length, which is normally the, the, the big difference between the two. Um, but our species that we see on the island is the island deca subspecies. Breeds mainly in Iceland, a few pairs up in the Faroe Islands, one or two pairs in Shetland and Orkney, but mainly Iceland. And then they come back down from Iceland to winter in the UK and France mainly, with smaller populations going further south to Portugal, Spain and Morocco. And this population is, is increasing. Um, at the 2018-2019 Webb's year, uh, the Webb's team estimated there was probably about 42,000 birds present in the UK. Um, if you go back 25 years ago, that estimate was 10,000. So you're talking about a 400% increase in this species. Now that type of increase in breeding is going to put more pressure on breeding sites. And if we look at the map in Iceland now, We've got the shady green areas, which are the long established sites in the south of Iceland. And we've got the dates there where they were first started breeding. And these are all being used to their full capacity now. So what's happening now is we're getting the new generation of finding newer sites in the north, which they couldn't get to in the past. Previous generations could never have used the north and northeast coastline of Iceland because this was subarctic conditions. But because of climate change now, the milder weather means that when the breeding season comes along, this habitat can be utilized by the black-tailed goblin. The habitat's not so good, so the breeding su success isn't quite so in, as good as it is down in the south coast. But it is still keeping to maintain numbers and this new generation is strengthening. Bearing in that, the new kids on the block are also looking for new wintering sites. So they're not going back to the old established sites. And we can see this as an example on the Isle of Wight. This is a, a graph of the Blacktail Godwit uh, Maxima of each year 
based on data between November and March of each year. And prior to 2006, Newtown was always the key site. We got up to one stage, a peak of 500 birds at Newtown. Quite a few coloured ring birds, because there's a large coloured ring program going on in, in Iceland that has been used for various studies of seeing where the birds are travelling, weight, uh, longevity, all various surveys going on on that. Uh, but you can see numbers are starting to dwindle at Newtown. And over the last 10 years, we've lost 48% of the uh, population wintering at Newtown. Conversely, the Western Yar numbers are going right up now, up to the, toward the 200 mark. We'd be slowly getting those going up. We're also getting populations now steadying out along the Medina estuary and in the website called Braiding Harbour, which is the amalgamation of Braiding Marshes and Benbridge Harbour. Um, so we're seeing all these extra birds going to different sites now, and none of them are ringed. The implication on that one is that the new breeding sites up in the north of Iceland haven't been touched very much by the ringing groups. So the inference from our brilliant Godwit team, headed by Thomas Gunnarsson up in Iceland, and in the UK by uh, Jenny Gill, chair of our BTO council, by, aided by Hampshire ringer Pete Potts, they're, they're of the feeling that this Western Yard population is the new kids on the block. These are the ones who are coming in now and taking over the population on the island. Some of the older birds are dying off at Newtown, so less young ones are turning up there, so numbers are decreasing. As this goes on, the Western Yard will get to a, a peak, and then the young birds will be, the, the new young birds will be looking for new sites. And they will then, it is thought, they'll be going back to Newtown and Newtown numbers will rise once more. But this is all a hypothesis. We need your help to be able to, 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 be able to prove this. And the best way would be to actually have a color ringed blacktail godwit, as in this example here. Um, this was back in August 2020. We suddenly had this marvelous uh, photo taken by one of our uh, Facebook uh, nature photographers, Sue Sibley. And she sent this over to me and said, I know you're interested in colouring birds. Is this of any use to you? It was like winning the lottery for me because we very rarely see a black tail god with rings. So I got hold of Thomas and he confirmed it was one of his birds. Sadly, it was one from the southern population, not from the northern. But um, it was an interesting one still because this one turned up with a flock of about a dozen other birds. And it's a bird that has been seen along the Hampshire coastline over the last few years, around about the August time, and then it's not seen again. So this infers that these birds are moving further south and part of those birds going down to Portugal and Spain. So uh, if you can e email Thomas with these, uh, with a photo or with any details, or if you have a problem, contact myself and I'll help you get the sighting logged. One day we will get one from the south, uh, from, from the north coastline, hopefully. Another way you can help with birds as well, we've got all different things going on. Blackbirds uh, are now nesting earlier. We've got warblers wintering. All these type of things can help if you enter your notes and your records onto a recording system. The ideal one is the BTO bird track system because that goes to the to BTO research but also goes in to the uh, Isla White bird recorder Robin Attrell and that ends up going into the Isla White bird report as well. So 
we've got links there to, to be able to register for bird track. And then finally, if you want to learn more about wader behavior, there's a great wader details blog I thoroughly recommend on the internet by Graham Appleton. And failing that, you can always take part in BTO surveys and contact me. Thank you very much for listening. It's time for me to fly. I'm looking forward now to Emily's presentation on red squirrels. Many thanks, Jim. And uh, they are, thank you, you've done my introducing uh, job for me there, which is very kind of you. Um, so uh, yes, I am now going to pass uh, over to our final keynote speaker, uh, our guest uh, from uh, the Bournemouth University is Dr. Emily Harduin, and she's a specialist in the distribution and mechanisms of the rad rapid adaptation of invasive species. So very much in line with some of the things we've been listening to today. And uh, Emily is going to be talking about something very dear to our hearts here on the Isle of Wight, which is red squirrels. So Emily, over to you. So yes, yeah, so today I'm not going to talk about invasive species. I'm mostly going to talk about native species, and I'm going to talk to you about the red squirrel. Um, so red squirrel is a species I only start uh, to work on uh, three or four years ago. And, and this is where we are, you know, like sort of like at the moment. Um, just if we think about, I mean, species in general, um, what is really sort of like interesting to look at, it's to look at the taxonomy. And for a species like the red squirrels, I always felt that the taxonomy was really well known. And actually, even though the species has been really well studied, like the taxonomy is way more complicated than, you know, like I thought it would be at the beginning. So just to give you, you know, like some kind of like a test of it. Um, so if you think about uh, Europe, so here you have a little map of like Europe, hope you guys can see it uh, on your screen. Uh, we do not know how many subspecies of red squirrels there is uh, in Europe, sort of like at the moment. And uh, looking at the, at the literature in 54, they were thinking they were just like 42 subspecies in 171, only 17 subspecies. Uh, but basically we are missing sort of like a real taxonomy work on red squirrels in order to know exactly how many subspecies there is. Um, so just to give you an idea, I'm talking about subspecies because of um, the because of one has been described to live in the British Isle. And this is Els um, Scarius Vulcari uh, sorry, um, Lucarius. And is it a British subspecies? And I put an interrogation point there uh, because we did not know if it is or not. So it has been described in the 18th century just on the basis of having a bleached tail. Now, if you uh, look at mammals, you know that uh, the fur will change from winter um, to the summer. So a bleached tail uh, may not be a very good characteristic to actually, you know, like describe the species. So there is, you know, like not so much evidence that the species, you know, like is there or even ever existed. Um, and we do not know if it's present, you know, like in the UK at the moment. So there is no specimen for which we can actually really study and look at, you know, like that British subspecies, um, so to say. And, and the reason why it's kind of like a little bit like the story of the Red Scrolls in the UK. Um, so if you think about the red squirrels in the UK, obviously they are in danger at the moment, uh, but they have been in danger for quite a long time and for different reasons. So, you know, like since the 17th and the 18th century, they became rare because of woodland clearance. But the thing which I find really amazing is British people always loved the squirrel. So even, you know, like sort of like back then, they started to do some translocation and bring squirrels, you know, like uh, all around. So they translocate some squirrel from the UK to some other, you know, like places in the UK, but also from Europe into the UK. And this is one of like the reason why we can't really study um, as uh, Lucurius, the British ship species, is because we, we need to have some museum samples which actually are dated back or which are, uh, which have been, you know, like, sorry, sampled before all that translocation happens um, in the UK. The thing which was being also like study with those little squirrels is um, some people are thinking that they have a Scandinavian origin. Um, so, you know, like for all that translocations. And what was 
quite interesting for uh, for us, or mostly for me, because I wanted to study the Isle of Wight and the Bronze and Fuzzy Red Scrolls. It's um, they find some museum samples in Blenford, and they actually find that those sample has a Scandinavian origin. Um, so now if we think a little bit about uh, the distribution of uh, S. vulgaris in the British Isles, well, this is how it used to be in 1945. Um, so in red, you have all the population of like the red scrolls. And you could see that red scrolls were uh, present in uh, most of Ireland, Scotland, quite a bit of England, not the center down there, Cornwall, Wales. And obviously uh, years passing by, the gray scrolls was there and tech, you know, like took a lot of like, or uh, sorry, no, you know, like the red scroll, you can only find them in uh, in Scotland, down there, Northern England, Wales, a little bit of like uh, Ireland as well, obviously the Isle of Wight here. Like the situation for the red scroll is not looking as bad as it used to be, you know, like 10 years ago, but still there is way more gray scrolls on the island uh, than red scrolls. Um, so yeah, so the problem for the for the reds are the grey scrolls. They have been introducing late 19th century. They kind of like a direct competitor, even though sometimes they use different food resources. Uh, but that is not really the problem. The problem uh, for the red scrolls, it's actually the grey scrolls came with a disease, uh, the squirrel pox virus. So the grass scroll is a carrier of that particular virus, so it doesn't affect them at all, but it does kill all the red scrolls. And this is the reason why uh, the red scrolls uh, population declined so quickly uh, in the UK. What's happening actually at the moment in the UK and how uh, British people are fighting uh, the grey scrolls is very interesting because now we know that grey scrolls are also in Italy. Um, which is kind of like a little bit more problematic because if they can pass the app, they can go to France and basically from them uh, invade the entire Europe. So there is kind of like quite a lot of like things for us to learn about uh, what's happened in the UK and try to make sure, you know, like this does not happen um, in Italy as well. Um, one of the things or some kind of like fact, which I found very interesting on the, on the Red Scroll when I started to, uh, to work on it, is leprosy. And this is actually a disease uh, which you can find. So here you have like two different pictures and you could see, you know, like the here of the scrolls. Um, so you can see like here you can, sorry, you can see sign of leprosy in the ears and also like in the nose down there. And they actually find leprosies in the UK squirrel, which was really, you know, like unexpected. So they find, you know, like two different types of infections. The first one with Mycobacterium lepromatosis, and this is the leprosy that you will find in England, Ireland, and Scotland. Um, when they look at it, they find that it diverged from the Mexican human strain like 20,000 years ago, so quite a long time ago. But the thing which I find really sort of like interesting is the leprosy uh, that they find on Bronze Island is a bit different. Um, so it's Mycobacterium leprae, and this is related to the one we used to have in the Middle Age in Europe. So it's kind of like another disease you can come, you know, like pass from, you know, humans to animals and um, vice versa. But don't worry, you can go on Bronte Island and have a walk. It's totally fine. It's totally safe. Uh, but just, you know, like think for thought about the leprosies and our pro squirrels. Thing which is also very interesting, and one of our collaborators, she was looking at leprosy a little bit more. And when she looked at the world, so she finds some squirrels from France, Germany, Switzerland, I think at Italy and some of the species uh, in uh, the US, she could only find leprosies in the British red squirrels. So you can't find it uh, anywhere else. Why is it the case? I do not know. Always find that, you know, like some kind of like interesting and they are studying it you know like a little bit further uh, in Edinburgh at the moment. Anyway for um, what I wanted to do at the beginning when I start uh, working on the on the Isle of Wight and on Bronze and Fuzzy was kind of like looking at the origin of the red scrolls uh, and if you guys remember in the introduction I was saying that we had some hints that they might come from Scandinavia. Uh, because we find these Scandinavian sequences in Blenford. Um, so this is basically uh, what I sort of like do. Uh, I think everybody knows the, the geography of the area. So we have the Isle of Wight around here. We have Bronze Island. And really close to Bronze Island, we have Fuzzy Island. 
And Fursey Island is a really tiny island. It's privately owned. There is around 20 squirrels on the island. Um, so sort of like really tiny populations, but we had some sample from there. Um, so when I started to study the squirrels, I was thinking, OK, we do not know exactly from where in Europe they are. Um, so I kind of like went to all the databases I could find, tried to find all the different sequences uh, from European squirrels, and I find a thousand, a little bit more of a thousand samples um, in 19 countries all around Europe. And the things which I found, which I find is kind of like quite amazing, the population we have here are genetically unique. So you can't really find them sort of like anywhere else. The other things which was uh, also very interesting to see, it's actually we do not find the Scandinavian haplotype in our population. So even though it has been in Blenford, it's not on Fursey Islands, it's not on the Isle of Wight, and it's not on Bronzy Islands uh, either. And when we were started to look at the origin, we were started to see, okay, you know, like if we look at our population, which population are they more closely related to? So are they really close to one another? They are close to Jersey, but they are mostly close to British populations. Just to, to look at the origin a bit more. So um, the origin of red squirrel on Fursey Island, actually we know when it happened. So Fursey Island is a privately owned island, and we know that in 77, uh, the people who owned that island brought two squirrels uh, down there from Kenoches. Um, so that origin, we know. Right? Uh, from Bronze Island, we actually do not know. We do not have any information. But again, when we look at the genetic, those samples look uh, like they are more of a British origin. The thing which was also nice uh, that we find in our in our data, it's actually uh, squirrels can migrate from Fursey Island to Bronze Island. There is 200 meters between those two islands, but they can swim uh, between both of them. When we think about the Isle of Wight, uh, we find exactly the same thing. Though. So they have a British origin. They look, you know, like uh, closely to what uh, you will find on Bronze Island. And I remember when I started to, you know, like work on the Isle of Wight scrolls, um, people were telling me that there is, you know, like this idea that Prince Albert uh, did brought some scrolls from Prussia to the Isle of Wight. We did not find any evidence of that, uh, of this, not at all. So we did not find any evidence of this uh, with the genetic data, but we did not find any reports or any, you know, like historical documents saying that this happened. Um, yeah, so that was for the origin of like the squirrels a little bit more. Now we wanted to have a closer look at the population of like uh, red squirrels on the island. So in order to do that, we looked at uh, different sort of like populations, different. So I had two populations from Germany, Baden Wittenberg and Bavaria, because it's always nice to look at the genetic diversity of an island and compare it to some continental populations. Uh, we had some samples from the Isle of Wight, from Bronze Island there, and from the Isle of uh, sorry, the Isle of Arran in Scotland up there. So the first thing you try to see is kind of like, okay, if we look at my Isle of Wight samples, who are they more closely related to? So we know that for the mitochondrial DNA, they were more closely related to Bronze Island. Now that we were looking at nuclear marker, we wanted to see if it was the same. And basically, this is what we did. So here you have, you know, like all the different populations, um, so different colors represent the different populations. What you can see here, I've got my German samples. I've got Baden Wittenberg and Bavaria, so they're closely related to one another. Uh, here I've got Bronze Island and the Isle of Wight, and you can see that they actually do cluster together. So it looks like they have, you know, like a common origin. And obviously, Ireland, uh, which is where more is Scotland, uh, look totally different from the rest, which is totally what we expected. Now, when we're looking at the genetic diversity, uh, we always expect to have lower genetic diversity on island when compared to mainland population. And this is exactly what we find. So the German population are more genetically diverse than all the islands, um, which is fine. I mean, this is totally what you expect. But now I wanted to have a closer look on the island because you want to actually see 
if you have or if you squirrels can actually migrate from one part of the islands to the other part of the island if they can move you know like uh, freely and in order to do that i do i did you know like an analysis what we call a population structure um so it does look sort of like that i'm not sure if you can see you know like uh, really nicely but every column here is uh, an individual so is a squirrels and the different color represents the number of like genetically different population we have interestingly on the olive white and i was not expecting that at all we find two different populations and if we look at this population a little bit closer we find that one cluster so this kind of like light gray is found mostly on the west part of the islands and the other one, the dark gray, is found mostly on the east part of the islands. Obviously, to, uh, for you to see a little bit better, here there is a map. And you can see here, when I'm on the west part of the island, I have uh, some samples which are more sort of like dark gray. So I represent one different uh, population when compared to the west uh, part of the island. And sort of like we tried to look a bit further and see, do we have, you know, like uh, some geographical barrier? Or, and what we find, actually, we find that the center of the islands might, have, uh, might act as a, as a barrier on the island. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about it because there is a little bit of like bias if you look at my map, because you can see if you look at the east part of the island i do have a lot of samples i also have quite a lot of like samples of the northwest but here in the center i do not have a lot of like sample and this is the thing that we're trying to do at the moment actually is trying to get you know like more sample from the center part of the island um, now if we look about uh, what i call the genetic health of the isle of white uh, squirrel it actually looks quite good so we have a lower genetic diversity than when you compare to continental population but this is totally what we expect we didn't find any sign of like genetic bottleneck so a bottleneck is a rapid reduction of the populations we did not find that it seemed that uh, population size is to be uh, constant we did not find a sign of inbreeding in the west and a little bit in the east, uh, but so far it looks sort of like um, quite good from our perspective. Now, in terms of like the conservations, you know, like uh, what what does it mean, you know, like from our funding? Uh, first of all, what it really means, um, so there is quite a lot of like already work which has been done on the Isle of Wight. Uh, to restore the woodland, to help the squirrel dispersal. And obviously that needs to continue. And we need to monitor the corridor on the Isle of Wight. And I know that Helen Butler is doing a lot of like work on this. Try to monitor, you know, like those, uh, those corridors to make sure that the squirrels can move from one part of the islands to the other. In terms of like the future work, uh, we're looking at getting some more sample in the center of the islands, and I know that Helen's already started to put some strap there, so we're going to have some hair and we're going to be able to uh, hopefully fill the gap here in the middle of the islands. We're also trying to investigate the possible barriers. Um, so why do we see those different two population and one of like the other things I would like to study I would like so we know that the Isle of Wight in terms of like the genetic diversity uh, they are less diverse than the continental population which again this is what you will find you know like all the time but we want to make sure that those populations still are able to adapt and we can actually do that using uh, genetic data uh, obviously, I didn't do all these works, you know, like by myself, and I need to say, you know, like quite a lot of like, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Roger for inviting me to the talk, uh, and also for being the ones who make me discover the Hall of White. I think before uh, he came and we went on a field trip with the students, I never, basically, I never, you know, went on the islands. I also really would like uh, to say a big thank you to Kathy Holder. Um, she's actually I've been working on Fursey and Bronzy Island and on, you know, like squirrels for a really long time. And she introduced me to the species and also to Helen Butler. I mean, Helen has been fantastic in uh, getting us, you know, like all the sample from the Isle of Wight, helping us with the interpretation of the data and, and all those things. So nothing would have been done uh, without those people. And also thanks a lot for all my um, collaborators who helped me to get, you know, like all those data. And yeah, thank you for your attention and let me know if you have some questions.
a great contribution there. And uh, yes, indeed, we're hoping to get some questions in. That's, that's the end of uh, the full presentations now. So we do have a little bit of time for some questions. And uh, I've been taking notes of uh, a few that we can ask. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask them to our speakers. If you've got any other questions, stick them in the chat. If we've got time, we will ask them. So we'll start, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll try and do it in order. Um, if we can go back to Juliet, if you remember, this was the, uh, our initial talk about the seaweeds. And uh, Pete Johnson has asked Juliet, you mentioned the high number of threatened native seaweeds in the UK waters. Is there anything we can do to help protect our own Isle of Wight seaweeds? Or is that just a mad idea? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Um... Well, I think that what would be really useful is we, the data that we have uh, is only the data that we have, you know. And so what we really need to do is for people to go out and look for species and to record species. It's always this sort of, you know, you know we, we, we have the results, but we don't know how accurate they are in a sense, that, you know. And so we're hoping to add to the big seaweed search based on the red data list some more species that people can go and hunt for. And I'm particularly keen for people to go and hunt for some of the commoner species. You know, it's all very well saying something's, you know, highly threatened. It's a bit too late by then. So we really need to know more about what's happening to some of these species that we think of as very common. And I think the other thing to do is what can we do? You know, this is a global problem as we know and the Isle of Wight of course is, is you know, just, is one area that's, that's going to be very affected by, by climate change for where it, where it lies. And, you know, you know, the whole problem is much bigger than that. But I think if we can really begin to keep a look, you know, I was thinking about the bird talk, it's very interesting things going on there, you know, and some species will be further, further north. So I think it's a question of doing all the right things and looking out for more species if you're keen to go out to record or to get people to do that. But it's not a daft question at all. We need to really love these things and we need to enjoy them and we need to look after them and teach our children and our grandchildren. Thanks very much. That's a, a great answer that everyone in the society would be very keen on. We love recording in our society. <laughs> and so, yes, absolutely anything. And anyone who wants to record any uh, species uh, of anything, seaweeds or anything, please get in touch with us. We'll be very happy to help. So uh, I'll ask one for uh, Ian now. Um, Ian, uh, Pete, uh, Pete Johnson again has asked, could we crowdfund a vertipool program around the island? And uh, I would add to that my own question, which uh, is funding actually the constraint that stops us putting out vertipools? Um, thanks, Matt, and thank you, Pete. Um, I mean, it, it's certainly a, certainly an option, but you're quite right. Really, the main constraint is is permission, really. So it's it's a highly regulated environment, and so being able to put these things out uh, needs to go through a certain process. And so far, that's largely been through university collaboration, um, which is sort of necessarily therefore bundled up with the funding that supports that, or through the planning system, where it's part of the the compliance ecology or the the, the mitigation scheme, which similarly is is probably outside the sort of crowd funding remit but if we could find a site which we were free to explore more fully particularly with the social dimension particularly with the idea of engaging as Juliet has, has just said engaging with people around these topics then absolutely crowdfunding would be perfect so it's definitely a possibility okay we'll, we'll put that one on the list then maybe we'll sort that out next year um and we got a question then for emily m hurst has asked you how can we control squirrel pox at least on the Isle of Wight, it's really good because obviously it's an island, so the grey squirrels can't come on the island. Therefore, you know, like that's a pretty good control just by itself. Um, but I think mostly it's a really, it's really highly transmissible. So what people are trying to do is just like reduce the population of like grey squirrels, you know, like when they can. So for example, by introducing pine martin, there is some works, you know, like we actually show that pine martin will mostly predate grey scrolls and not red scrolls because um, yeah so it's kind of like all those things but I think for the Isle of Wight it's actually great so you should not import any grey scrolls on, on the island basically. We'll do our very best not to. Okay and another one for uh, for Juliet and uh, Jane Willard has asked what are our local herbivores by which I assume she means uh, herbivores of seaweeds. 
Yeah, well, I don't know, I haven't done a study of them, but it'll be things like, you know, the sort of little snails and, and gammarid type things. Uh, I need a zoologist to help me here. But you know, you, if you go and have a look, you'll see there's all sorts of little grazers around. So it'll be, it'll be things like uh, limpets, uh, snails, gammarids, all those sorts of things. And they'll be like, you know, on, on the land where you've got them eating different parts, you know, some will be sort of the whole plant and some will be when it's sort of more, more detritus and that sort of thing. So a whole wide range of different things. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's an area that I'd really like to sort of know a bit more about and what the truth is. And you see some of those species that are aliens, you know, I mentioned they have certain traits that enables them to be aliens. Not everything becomes an alien. But they sometimes also put out these secondary metabolites as well, which makes them um, maybe slight, they might be toxic, particularly to, to grazers that are not used to them. You know. So I don't know, I hope that answers the question. Oh, that's very, very comprehensive, yes. Thank you. And uh, another one to you then from William Farnham. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, have there been any extinctions as a result of introductions? I think the answer is probably yeah. yes. Well, well, not that we know of in Britain, no. Uh, the, the, the biggest problem that has impacted, as far as I can tell, at least in the past, was the Victorian seaweed collectors. And they basically, you know, there was this Mrs. Griffiths and Mrs. Wyatt, they were down in um, Devon. And you could, you know, you could get these stamp collections. I saw there was something about um, Queen Victoria and things like that. Queen Victoria's children, the one who became king, he made a, a seaweed album, for example, and it's at Windsor Castle and we went and we photographed all the, the these um, albums and all these seaweeds around the local herbaria in Britain. And at that time, they've all got masses of this Codium bursa, which is a, a sort of very charismatic seaweed that looks like a little mini football. Or they've all got the species that Roger Herbert knows a lot about, which is Podina, the peacock's tail. They, they basically picked out this Codium bursa. It is now extinct on the mainland as a consequence. So um, I'm, I'm less worried about the aliens. The one I am slightly worried about is, is, is the Andaria, but all the others I'm not particularly worried about. Some of them actually actually provide hosts for other species to live on. They can increase diversity. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian, back to you again. Helen Slade asks, could vertipoles be valuable in non-marine habitats? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we've tried them in a couple of places which have been really kind of school, school projects where we've intercepted uh, uh, so, uh, uh, surface water from, from, from the roof and run it through a series of pools so that the children have got a, an area uh, to sort of experiment with and play with. The thing we're really interested in and is about to happen in Hebden Bridge is in a freshwater setting. So actually putting them in a storm channel uh, in, a, in freshwater. The same principle should apply. Really interested in the idea of turning them through 90 degrees, so pointing the thin end upstream and they immediately become something like a kind of backwater pool so a refuge for, for for fish fry and things like that so certainly they have an application elsewhere that we're still learning about yeah absolutely right thank you ian and uh one more seaweed one julia should we be promoting the human consumption of invasive seaweeds a <laughs> uh, very good question well um yeah <laughs> Well, I think people are eating sargassum and I'm sure people will be eating on dairy. You know, there's a big vogue for foraging at the moment. I, I mean, I, I'm always a bit cautious of foraging to make sure things are clean. I've done quite a lot of microbiome work and I tell you, I wouldn't ever eat a seaweed off the beach, but that's just me. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think why not? If, if, you know, if people like them and they are healthy, they're supposed to be healthy for you and, and you're not taking too much. I, th I think it's like everything. I'm not with the aliens, you know, if they're here and they've been here a long time, it's a bit like naturalized species. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really want to pick some of those out necessarily. Now, if you think on the land, for example, but yeah, you can eat them for sure. If you want okay. to. <laughs> Thanks very much. And uh, our last question before we have to close, because uh, time we, we have run a little bit over time, but thanks to our speakers for um, uh, keeping us time. One last question, um, which Juliet has asked, 
and I'll address that to Ian, which is what is the risk of spreading alien species with vertebrals? Oh, <laughs> so, well, now I, I'm afraid I, I cheated a bit and asked Dr. Alice Hall, who I know is on the call, and of course, Bo and Roger will certainly have a take on this as well. Of course, it's a really important question. And, and the, the answer is, is that we're still learning. So the oldest ones are out of seven years old. So far, the only non-native that has been recorded in vertebral arrays has been sargassum weed. But questions about the location, about the timing of installation, these are all things that need to be, there needs to be a precautionary approach to them. And certainly the idea of introducing them, in, essentially introducing a rocky shore habitat into an area where there are no rocky shore species, for example, you know, it, ways of making the, uh, of avoiding that kind of threat uh, are necessary parts of the planning of these things. But so far, the idea of high complexity habitat seems to work in favor of a native um, colonization, but that's so far. Okay, well, thanks Ian, and uh, thanks Juliet for the question. And uh, I'll, I'll just give a quick plug that uh, on Wednesday the 7th of April, our final uh, uh, seminar will be a continuation of this Habitats and Species one. Anne Marston will be introducing uh, the seminar and uh, you can book your place now for presentations on including the future of the island's heathlands, woodlands on the Isle of Wight biosphere and the future of the island's habitats and species. So don't forget to join us on Wednesday. And the last thing I must do is to say thank you to everybody for coming along. Thank you particularly to our speakers uh, for giving their time and uh, such an excellent array of presentations. Uh, thank you to the many volunteers and contractors who've helped to make this series of uh, events possible, especially to Roger Herbert, Tina Whitmore, and to our coordinator, Joe Redston. So that's all we have time for this evening. Thanks for your time. And I hope to see you all on Wednesday. Thank you.